There is a smell that locomotive crews learn to fear. Aniseed. Sweet, sharp like licorice. If you caught that smell in the cab of an A4, you had seconds, maybe less. It meant the bearing was melting. And what comes after that? Nobody wanted to find out. On the morning of July 3, 1938, they placed a capsule of aniseed oil inside Mallard's middle cylinder bearing, right between the frames, where you could not see it, where you could not reach it. That was their warning system, a stink bomb. And then they told Joe Duddington to push this thing harder than any locomotive had ever been pushed. The A4s had a serious weak point, Gressley never fully tamed. His conjugated valve gear put more load on the middle cylinder than intended. That inside cylinder often carried more of the workload than the outside too. All that stress went straight into the middle big end bearing. Push past 110 miles per hour and that bearing starts to cook. Push past 120 miles per hour and you are gambling with your life. Silver Fox had already burned its middle big end at 113 miles per hour. The 1948 trials would see three A4s suffer failures, all middle cylinder related. At least one A4 is recorded as having suffered serious internal damage at the end of its middle cylinder after a failure, exactly the kind of mechanical destruction crews knew could happen if a big end let go at speed. Gressley's workaround for this weakness was aniseed oil. Pray you smell it in time. Joe Duddington was 61, 27 years on the footplate. The kind of driver you call when you need someone willing to push a locomotive past what it should endure. Tommy Bray was firing, young, strong, and ready to shovel until his arms gave out. Sid Jenkins was inspecting, and in the dynamometer car, the Westinghouse team, officially there to test brakes. At Barkston, someone offered them a taxi to Peterborough to skip the return run. Every single one refused. They knew exactly what was about to happen. The Germans held the record, 124.5 miles per hour, level track, no damage. That is what they had to beat. Mallard crawled through Grantham at 24 miles per hour. Track work, speed restriction, it ruined their momentum. By Stoke Summit, they were doing 75 miles per hour. It should have been more, but this was the hand they were dealt. Then Stoke Bank dropped away beneath them a 1 in 200 gradient, a 240 ton train, and gravity doing what gravity does, 87 miles per hour at the first mile marker. Joe held the regulator wide open. Tommy was already working, shovel into the tender, coal into the firebox again, again, again. The heat pouring from that firebox could blister skin, 96 miles per hour. The wheels were screaming now. Steel on steel at that speed becomes a living thing, a howl that digs into your skull. Joe could feel every vibration through the soles of his boots, through the controls in his hands. Tommy's shovel never stopped, sweat running down his face, coal dust sticking to it, arms burning. The firebox needed constant feeding at this speed, let the pressure drop and the run was over. And somewhere deep in that middle cylinder, where nobody could see, the bearing temperature was climbing. They hit Stoke Tunnel doing 116 miles per hour, inside pitch black. The dynamometer car went dark. Nobody had switched the lights on. All you could see was fire. Red hot coals falling from the grate bouncing off the tunnel walls. Sparks everywhere. The technicians grabbed for handholds, unable to see their instruments, unable to see anything. The guards scrambled to get the lights working, and then they shot out of the tunnel, and Mallard was still accelerating. The whole train was shaking now, not a gentle vibration, violent shaking. Joe could feel the locomotive fighting him, the frame twisting under forces it was never built to withstand. Behind them, crockery was smashing on the floor. Passengers clung to seats to each other. At Little Bitham, cinders started shooting from the chimney, not sparks, chunks of burning coal, bullet-sized trailing fire as they flew. Later reports claimed windows shattered as the train tore past. Tommy was still shoveling. His entire world reduced to the firebox door, the coal, the shovel. Open, throw, close. Again, again. Keep the pressure up. Keep her running. Joe felt it, that wrongness in the motion. Something grinding that should not grind. And then the dynamometer needle touched 126 miles per hour. One second. One single peak on the paper roll. Joe grabbed the brake, not because of the Essendine curves ahead, 
because he knew. The smell hit the cab like a wave, aniseed, sweet and sharp and everywhere. The bearing had melted. The white metal, the soft alloy meant to keep the bearing surfaces apart, had liquefied from the heat. The capsule had burst. The countdown was over. What happens when a big end seizes at 126 miles per hour? The connecting rod locks solid, metal welds to metal. Then it snaps, a steel arm heavy enough to wreck anything in its path, spinning at thousands of revolutions per minute, suddenly breaking free. It does not just stop. It punches through the cylinder, through the frame, through anything in its way. An A4 had already come frighteningly close to that kind of destruction. And at this speed, with 240 tons behind you, that kind of failure can throw a locomotive off the rails. The consequences would be catastrophic. Mallard's bearing had not seized, not yet, but it was grinding, held together by nothing but luck and prayer. Duddington knew what he had to do. Keep the speed low. Keep the load off the bearing. From Essendine to Peterborough, they held her at roughly express speed, nursing that ruined bearing every mile. Fourteen miles of grinding metal. Every revolution of those driving wheels was metal on metal, the bearing getting weaker with every minute. Tommy stopped shoveling. There was no point pushing her now. They just had to survive. Joe watched the track ahead, listening for any change in the rhythm. One wrong clunk, one vibration out of place, and it was over. The smell of aniseed still hung in the cab, mixing with coal smoke and steam and sweat. At Peterborough, they pulled Mallard off the train before the wheels had even stopped turning. An Ivot Atlantic, 30 years old, Edwardian era, coupled up to take the coaches to London. Mallard was done. And this is where it gets ugly. The LNER publicity department had prepared for this. They knew the locomotive might not survive the attempt. They had photographs ready, press releases written, and a backup engine standing by. They weren't hoping Mallard would make it. They were planning for it to break. The head of publicity started handing out photos before the IVAT was even coupled up. The locomotive was still steaming, with the bearing destroyed, and they were already celebrating. They got their headlines, and they came far closer to disaster than they ever admitted. Gressley looked at the data that night. It showed 126 miles per hour for one second, a single peak on a paper roll that might not have been moving smoothly. He refused to accept it. He told the press 125. He wouldn't put his name to a number he didn't trust. He wanted another run in September 1939. No speed restrictions this time. He calculated 130 miles per hour was possible if they did it right. Then Germany invaded Poland. The war began. The attempt was canceled. Gresley passed away in April 1941. He never got his second chance. The Americans claimed faster. T1s were known for high-speed running, and plenty of crew anecdotes put them at 120 miles per hour or more. But Pennsylvania Railroad avoided official record attempts because of too much liability and too much risk, so nothing was ever documented. So Mallard keeps the crown, not because it was definitely the fastest, but because it had the paperwork, and because it survived. That is what nobody puts on the plaques. The bearing did not simply overheat, it melted. A few more miles at those temperatures and that connecting rod was at real risk of letting go. At 126 miles per hour, that is not mechanical failure, that is catastrophe. Mallard went back into service. New bearing, new white metal, back to work. 25 more years, one and a half million miles. Nobody ever tried to break the record again. Because Mallard did not just set a world record, it survived one. And nobody else has ever been willing to get that close to disaster. 